And I'm Bruce. I'm a lapsed physicist, mathematician, currently the vice president of the Vancouver Electric Vehicle Association. And uh, I do have a software company that may do something with machine learning at some point. Lapsed physicists are my favorite kind of people. Yeah, I love them. I love them. Fortunately, there's lots of them around, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I think I'm going to stand over here and uh, tell you about what I learned about this competition. The grasp and lift EEG detection uh, competition. Uh, I did not participate in this competition. I just went after the fact and read all the stuff that happened there. <clears throat> I also, uh, coming to this, I don't know anything about EEGs or anything before, so you're in luck. If you don't know anything about EEGs or anything to do with them, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about that. So just some uh, facts and figures about the competition itself. It ran uh, last year for a couple of months, uh, $10,000 in, in prizes, as these things. I'm also kind of kind of assume not everyone's 100% familiar with Kaggle competitions, even though you're at a Kaggle meetup. Anyway, $10,000 that's split between the top three uh, winners. Uh, 379 teams. That's a pretty respectable. Um, an image classification competition might get 1,500 teams. Uh, the popular ones are a little more up like that. A 379 for a medical thing, EEG, that, that's pretty good actually. Another way that in the group is we're picking competitions to talk about is how many forum topics are there? Oh good, MoseyPro is protecting my files, that's great. <laughs> uh, so worried about that. Um, <laughs> so the, um, the forums are a rich source of information. 77 forum topics, that's actually a little bit low, but it tells you there, there was a lot of activity. Number of kernels, which is just how much code did people sort of post and share, 121, that's great. And uh, it's always fun to know, did I do that? <laughs> oh, <yeah>. um, no. <laughs> that, uh, can't I go into like airplane mode or something? Yeah, get a Mac. Yeah, get a Mac. Uh, and that may be the, one more thing and I'll go into airplane mode. Um, you can, even though the competition is closed, all the data is still available. Uh, everyone's code is still available for download to play around with, and you can uh, train your own models, submit the results, and get rated as if you were in the live competition. And it'll tell you how you would have ranked the, uh, the people that uh, were there when it, was, when it was live. Okay, so there's that. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve here? Uh, as it says in the box, we're trying to identify when a hand is grasping, lifting, and replacing an object using EEG data. So um, this uh, picture in the lower left is someone wearing an EEG, I don't know what they call it, helmet, uh, with all those little white things are uh, sensors that are picking up electrical uh, activity within the brain, somewhat localized to where that sensor is. And the output uh, is something like this. You get all these traces. So each sensor, you get these varying uh, voltages. This is time running along this axis. And the uh, different traces are like one per sensor. The uh, particular data set that we're working with here, this is an, actually a video from how the data was gathered. Uh, you can see that there's this little device here. A little LED goes on. That signals a person to lift this up, hold it until the LED goes off, they put it down, and put their hand back. And the uh, challenge here is, can you look at all these squiggles and figure out that those six events uh, in that sequence uh, were happening? So that's what his head would look like? like are, there, that, yeah. are there sensors around uh, his No, cheeks? this is not the actual placement of the uh, in this particular case, because I think they did not want to get... You know, they're not trying to pick up eye activity and other things, so mm -hmm. uh, it's less. But 32 is quite a lot, so there would be good coverage around the, okay. around the skull. Where, where is the stuff on the article? Uh, I'll come to that. Um, that's where they get ground truth, is the short answer. But And we'll, we'll see this picture again. Electrocute yeah. him if he's wrong. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's like a Milken thing all over again. Are these five or diaphragms? Describe muscle movement? No, it's the electrical activity oh, in the brain. Okay. So EEGs, electroencephalographs or grams, um, are they're this non-invasive technique. They put these uh, sensors, and uh, your brain, when when it's active, basically the, the chemical actions uh, of the neurons in talking to each other 
creates an electrical uh, potential, mm -hmm. which can be picked up by these sensors. Okay. Um, and I understand for each sensor, it's kind of looking at a cluster of about 50,000 neurons. Uh, it has to be that many before you get enough to, for it to, to register. And they are depicted via this muscle? No, no, no. It's no. Strictly, strictly the stuff on the head. The muscles are there because, um, okay, apparently I have to talk about the, the, those. <laughs> that um, uh, they wanted to know, they, they wanted time when these various actions started. And, and, and change, so they uh, put all these muscle sensors on. Okay. So when the person starts moving his hand, uh, that's picked up by the muscle sensors, and that gives the reference time for when the, the event of moving the hand started. Okay. That's why the picture is somehow misleading, because uh, you don't show the head of the person. But yeah, they didn't, they didn't, but they just assumed everyone knows what, what an EG looks like, I guess, when they put that video together. Excuse me, could, could you say that they're uh, looking to discover causation, like between particular neuron segments and uh, muscle movements, and also they're they're doing timing. Of how fast? That well, happens. they're looking to pick up intention. So if you think I'm going to move my hand now, or mm -hmm. you know I, I want to move my hand, you you whatever your brain does to make your hand actually start moving, there's some activity in the brain that causes your hand to actually move. And so um, that's what they're, you know, out of all this, they're trying to figure out that your brain is trying to tell your hand to move or telling your hand to move. Maybe it would help if you sort of restated, uh, like, why would you want to have so, achieved this company? Tell you what, let me go on okay. for another slide or two, and maybe it'll make a little bit more sense. Um, well, here's the intended application. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody read the slide when it was up for two seconds. Anyway, the, the intention is to have uh, make more intelligent prosthetic devices. People have lost use of their hands for one reason or another. Maybe it's an amputation. They've got an artificial hand, and uh, they want to be able to, you know, initiate grasping motions just by thinking about it, uh, rather than some other way. Like maybe there's no muscle availability there. Um, so that's that's the idea uh, to essentially let people control these prosthetic devices with their brains, just like as if they had a, a natural hand. The, um, there's a consortium that hosted this competition. They're called WAY. I think they deserve some sort of a prize for the most inventive uh, acronym. <laughs> WAY stands for Wearable Interfaces for Hand Recovery. It seems a little strange. It's uh, A in uppercase. <laughs> yeah, it's part of you see that this A is this A and awesome. this Y. It's, 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 it's really great. So. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> some sort of European uh, European consortium that's, that works on these things. I'll tell you what that was. It's the French. They love acronyms. The French love acronyms. They love okay. acronyms. They put them everywhere. Okay. There we go. It's so the you think they'd be a little bit better at it? <laughs> this is typical. <laughs> this is <laughs> typical. There we go. All right. So that's the intended application. So uh, any other questions on on that before we? Okay. I um, thought I wasn't going to get past the first slide. Uh, it's just me between you and beer, I'm telling you. So. <laughs> and there's actually a lot to talk about here because I'm going to talk about the three winners and they all use very different techniques, so there's a lot to talk about. Okay, so the information that they give you in the competition, a bunch of CSV files, uh, they're just it's two-dimensional data. Uh, the rows, rows and columns. So the rows are basically uh, time frames. Um, the data is recorded at 500 hertz. That's actually pretty uh, pretty high frequency rate. And the columns are uh, the 32 different channels. And in the case where you have uh, training data, then the, the labels indicating the six uh, events and whether those are occurring at, at the times or not. So it's like we took that picture from the last slide. We turn it sideways. So now time is running this way. Um, these are the rows, and across here the columns are the, uh, the different uh, channels. Sorry, I missed it. What are the six events? So the six events are, uh, and I'll, I'll actually list them in a second, but it's like, you know, you start hand motion the first time you touch it, you're grasping it, lift, uh, drop it down, let go. Was that five or six? It's something like so that. So they do that every single time? Yeah, they do that over and over. And, if, and well, and here it is. So they talk about trials. So there's six events per trial. So that's one entire sequence of lift and whatever. 
There's about 30 trials in a series, so they had people do this for about four minutes, and I guess probably people start, you know, <laughs> getting goofy after four minutes of doing this. Um, so that becomes a series, and then there's 10 series per subject. Uh, there were 12 subjects, so that's people who participated in this experiment. And obviously, these are healthy people. Uh, they're, they're trying to figure out how the healthy brain and hand interacts so they can apply it to people <laughs> who don't have a healthy hand. Uh, so they're all healthy subjects. And uh, 10 series per subject, a little bit good to know this just because it comes up in how the data is prepared. So series 1 through 8 is the training data. Uh, series 9 and 10 are used uh, for test. So they give us the, the labels uh, for the different events, for the training data, and your task is to predict uh, on these, uh, where you don't have the labels, you know, are the events happening at any, at any particular time, and that's what you submit. So it's about a gigabyte of, of data altogether. I just mentioned that because, as Quinn mentioned, some of us are working on another EEG competition. There's like 60 gigabytes of data in that one. So, uh, what are, are the labels again? Just like picking up and not picking up? Uh, the labels are, there's kind of, hmm. so if you think of six, six columns yeah. over the right here, yeah. uh, one of the columns will be lifting up. Yeah. And there will be zeros and ones in that column. Yeah. So it will be ones if you are in the, the state of picking it up. Mm. I'll, say about, uh, I'll say a bit more about that in just a second, because it actually turns out to be just a touch subtle how that is... Describe. Can I, can I ask, in the test set, do you know which subject it is? Like, are you able to you, draw that connection? You do. Yes, you do know the subject, and in fact, uh, they encourage you to train per subject. Um, and obviously, I, I ordered my slides completely wrong because all these questions are all answered later. But anyway, that, that's great. Uh, so there's the actual six events: uh, hand start, first digit touch, both start, load phase, lift off, replays, both release. Those sound just a touch ambiguous. Um, you're right. And in fact, there's some overlap in the training data of events happening at the same time, which is a bit of a confusion for people. But anyway, so they run this again and again, and you predict for every time frame. And so you know these are occurring always in temporal order. And you do know these are occurring always in temporal order, which um, they uh, can... Competitors made some use of that, but it wasn't completely obvious how to do that. But one, of the, at least one of the competitors were explicit about the fact that they used that information. So it seems sensible. <clears throat> okay, uh, what I'm calling the ground truth data is what, it, what are these labels that they're giving you for training? This is supposedly the, the accurate stuff, right? So you can train your models. Uh, first of all, the subject wore earplugs. I thought that was kind of interesting, but they want to not have a whole bunch of audio processing activity going on in your brain, so they make it as quiet as possible. Uh, these muscle sensors that we've talked about a bit, uh, they're EMG sensors, which I forget what that stands for, but they're kind of all over the place. Uh, there was lots of speculation on the forums and elsewhere that signals from these, because they're you know electrical devices, are just like polluting the data we're getting from the um, EEG data. Uh, I'll, have, I'll have some more to say about that in a bit. Okay, the labeling, exactly how was this done? So you've got these six label columns. The entries in those columns are zero or one, uh, depending on whether the corresponding event has occurred within 150, plus or minus 150 milliseconds. So from their EMG sensors, they'll see that, okay, at this time, you know, this event happened. But then they'll go forward and back from that, 75 frames, and put ones in uh, in the training column. So, uh, in the label column. Uh, so, you can sort of see they have to do something to kind of smear out the time when these things start, because they're not that precisely timed events. Uh, uh, but it leads to some difficulties in sort of managing it. I have to admit, I never completely wrap my head around what I would have done to deal with this. So these events are supposed to be discrete times. They're, They're supposed to be like discrete maps. times. It's yes. not while I'm picking it up and I'm still picking it up. No, it's the, it up. well, the other crazy thing is uh, sometimes it's the initiation of the event, sometimes yeah. it's the cessation of the event. Okay, but they are supposed to be like one But they are supposed time. to be just at one point in time. Yeah. Did you have some overlap on there since they're spreading out across? Yes, so like, yes, okay. yes, and that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> But it's life. Deal with it. <laughs> yes? Was there any word as to why they chose 75 frames? Or was this a tuning frame? Or? 
No, I didn't see any explanation of that. It's just like, we had to do something and flip the coin and up came 75. Well, yeah. Probably it's based on the distance between brain and your eye. So that gives you enough time because you think of it first and you move it over. You, you push it first and you just receive it in your head afterwards. Yeah, three, that, three that makes some five. sense. Mm -hmm. What's that? That's three times 25. <laughs> it, it's that, but I know I, 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 I like Lad's uh, explanation that there's some there's some time scale involved in just brain to, to hand, and so you want to allow for that. Okay, that's that. Uh, how was it scored? Well, it was just the AUC average over columns. How many people know what that phrase means? A couple. How many don't know what that means? Almost everybody. Good. So I didn't really know what that meant. Uh, kind of, kind of. So let's like a, take a little tour to talk about that because it's kind of super important for the competition. So it starts with a thing called a receiver operating characteristic, which is whoops, I just did something super bad. There, there we go. Uh, receiver operating characteristic, which when I first heard that I thought, wow, that sounds like some 1940s radio technology or something. Which in fact is exactly what it is. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so what are we doing? We're making we're making a model that makes predictions of uh, events happening, and uh, we're going to predict not just zeros and ones. We're going to predict probabilities that uh, that the event is is happening, and it's those predictions are going to be correct or not correct. Um, so there will be some uh, true positives we predicted correctly, there'll be some false positives. We you know, said the event was happening, but it, but it wasn't. And there's other ways of looking at errors. But those two are chosen. You plot the true positive rate versus the false positive rate, uh, and you vary a, a parameter to generate this curve. So what does that mean, vary a parameter? So you're, you're generating probabilities. Uh, so maybe you've got a probability of 0.35. The training data says one is the right answer. So you've got to convert your your you know, numbers between zero and one to zeros and one. So you need to threshold it somewhere. So you might think, well, I'll just pick 0.5. Uh, that would actually be pretty terrible because certainly the data I'm working with, all the numbers are below 0.5. Um, so, and it's just typically not done that way. So instead you'd say, well, we could pick thresholds of any value we want and see how good the uh, classifier is at those different values of the threshold. That's what this is. So uh, you put in all possible values of the threshold and, and, and calculate the uh, true positive, false positive rates and plot that point, and then that's, that's your curve. Now, um, if you had a perfect classifier, this curve would just shoot right up to one and be all the way, uh, all the way across because you would have a true positives all the time. And uh, if you think about the area under this curve, in the case where you just go right up the top and across, that area is 1. If you had the world's worst classifier and just got it wrong all the time, that this curve would be right down here. The true positive area would be 0. And the area under this blue line would be uh, also 0. So the area under the curve, AUC, is the area under this blue thing. And it's the number between 0 and 1. And the perfect classifier would be 1. Random guessing puts you on the diagonal, uh, and uh, 0.5 would be uh, the value of the AUC in that case. So just a little bit more about this. Um, this is often used in medical statistics, apparently. I don't exactly know why, although it's kind of interesting. True positives sort of, car you think about a medical treatment, true positives kind of correspond to a benefit, false positives are a cost. Like if you're going to treat somebody and you correctly identify this as an appropriate treatment, then you're getting a benefit. If you think you're, or if you, you know, incorrectly think you should apply this treatment, then it's going to cost you something and may have side effects, whatever. It's, it's, a, it's a bad thing. That's, that's kind of a cost. So I guess when they're looking at benefits and costs, they think of it this way. Uh, AUC is useful when you've got skewed distributions, unequal classification error costs, whatever. Uh, you can think of it as the probability that a classifier will rank a randomly chosen positive instance higher than a randomly chosen negative instance. Uh, and there's another way to think about it, too. So um, the practical import for a competition like this is, um, you're, first of all, you need to generate probabilities for your predictions, not zeros and ones. You want to generate probabilities. And uh, the good news is you don't have to pick a threshold for your probabilities, because that's not part of the deal. 
Uh, the other interesting thing about an AUC is uh, you could take your whole set of probabilities to calculate the AUC, and if you, say, divided all those numbers by two, you're going to get the same AUC. It's invariant to uh, those kind of uh, transform. It's actually invariant to any sort of monotonic function that you would apply to it. So it smears out a lot of stuff. So it's sort of like accuracy, but it's not exactly like accuracy in any kind of mathematical way, but definitely related to it. All right, we also have sort of cool on AUC. <laughs> All right, good. So back to how was it scored? So the AUC was calculated for each of the six different events. And then they just take the average AUC, and that's the single number you get as, as your score, as how good your uh, submission is. Uh, so again, you output probabilities, not class labels. Uh, the benchmark score is just 0.5 for random guessing. And, uh, oh, this is interesting. Uh, a lot of competitions, we don't get this number, but the host's in-house score. Somebody asked, and they answered, which is uh, internally with this data, they were able to get 0.95 uh, wow. AUC, which is pretty good. Pretty good. Um, AUC is probably a little higher than accuracy, so I know we're all thinking accuracy, but still, that's good. That's really good. Uh, now, the best score in the competition, uh, spoiler alert, was 0.98. Um, spread among the top 10% of entries in the competition was between 0.94 and 0.98. This graph here, which you probably can't see very well, but it's just I just sorted and plotted all the, the leaderboard scores after the uh, competition. You see a lot of people just uh, you know just guessed randomly. I don't know what these people were doing. <laughs> just trying to fool it. Um, actually, the interesting thing is if you have an AUC that's less than 0.5, you just invert all your predictions, and then <laughs> people do it. Uh, <laughs> so that's the benchmark, and uh, the host is up here. So you can see you, you got to get pretty far along before you get better than the host. you got to be pretty good. But people were significantly better than the host. All right, now another, uh, at some point we'll actually talk about the com competition uh, the winners did, but a little more background on how you analyze EEG data, mostly because I had to learn all this stuff myself, and I'm going to put you through it too. There's kind of three types of information you can try to pull out of an EEG data set. So there's spatial information. Uh, as I said before, you know where these different sensors are, so you can create heat maps of activity. Here there's a lot of activity, and here there's maybe even a suppression of activity in the brain when something's going on. Oh, oh this is the, the top view of a person's head, that's a nose in two years. Um, again, uh, big activity here, not so much here. Um, so, somebody on the competition had a lot of fun just generating a whole bunch of these things. I don't know how informative it is, but spatial information is available. So, sorry, what does yes. the heat map represent? Is that like how much the... Uh, what's the essentially, si signal? Essentially, yeah, it's, it's like the power that's coming from that area of the, the sensor's picking okay. up. Okay. How, how do they locate the, uh, the, each of the 32 <coughs> sensors? There's actually standard layouts for these sensors, quite a few different standard layouts, but one of them was used in this particular experiment, and that was known to the uh, competitors. So the person who generated these heat maps, he, there's a, you know, tools, that, you know, Python tools that they use, and you just plug in, it's this sensor schema that I'm using, and it, it appropriately mapped it out. I think these are at an instant in time, too. The, yeah, the one I'm showing you, this is at an instant in time. So it, it would be actually kind of interesting to see this, yeah, played out over, and mm -hmm. you know, make a little movie out of it, right? Is, is that actually useful in the competition? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, the guy who did this is, is a, like an EEG kind of expert guy, and he put these up there for people, and it may, maybe it was helpful to him. I think you'd have to pre have some expertise in the area to, for this to really tell you anything. Did that guy do well in the competition? Yeah, he became number one. Oh. <laughs> and we're up against him in this. Oh uh, no! Yeah. And is Pat here? Pat's not here tonight. Oh, there he is. Yeah, yeah. So you know this guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, Alex. Alex yeah. yeah. So there are like some areas that you know to be correlated to stuff like emotion. Is right area like firing in that area correlates to emotion? If you see activity in that area, it's more likely. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, so, I'll, so, so, sorry. Go ahead. Alex wrote about, I think, those uh, left motor cortex is corresponding to the right hand moving, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and there's something called uh, event-related desynchronization. So he mm -hmm. says that when there's a decrease in power spectrum in that area, it corresponds to the hand moving. 
So and the layout I think they used was ten slash five percent, like and they're labeled. So the mm -hmm. the electrodes are FP one, so it's like prefrontal cortex, whatever one, mm -hmm. and there's standard layouts. And they're called montages. So. Montage. Yeah, I'm calling it schema. Montage is the right word. Yeah. Amateur. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, such a noob, <laughs> classic noob mistake. Um, so, uh, yeah, see, I told you this EG stuff is fun. Uh, if, if nothing else, I mean, it's exploratory. You know, you always want to look at your data in different ways just to get a handle on it. It might, might be a bit of a sanity check. I mean, if you look at the training data and there's supposed to be, you know, activity happening here, but the motor cortex isn't lighting up, you've got to wonder what's, what's really going on. Um, so, that's an example of spatial information. Uh, there's other kinds of spatial information you could conceivably use. Uh, in fact, we'll see a bit of that, uh, but in, in kind of a crude way. Okay, the second category of information would be spectral information, like the frequency content of this data. These are all time series. They, you can take a Fourier transform and look at their uh, the power and all the different uh, frequencies that are available. Uh, in fact, that's what this is, a spectrogram. So time is running this way, and um, uh, frequencies are running up this way, and the colors indicate uh, you know, how much. Red is a, is a high, high power, blue is low power. Uh, mm. And lots and lots of uh, competitors very naturally used uh, spectral information for in all sorts of different ways, and we'll, we'll see that. Uh, okay, finally then, there's uh, temporal information where you're still in the time domain, um, and you uh, sometimes want to look at this, and we'll come back to um, this in a minute, but just the general idea is, um, these are the ERPs, right? This is event-related uh, potential. So what they've done here is they've taken an event that's been repeated many, many times, and they, um, oh, and this isn't quite right. I'm going to say it anyway, even though it's not quite right. And then they, they stack them all up. They, they know at what time the event occurred. They stack those all up and then average them out. And that gets rid of a lot of the noise, and it brings out the features that are indicative of that uh, particular event. Um, so, good thing nobody can see the labels on this because you realize that's not true what I just said, but it's, it's true in a different context that we'll see in a minute. Okay. Yes? Uh, are, are the frequency bands kind of like, are they like distinct? Uh, I, I can't really see from the spectral language. Yeah. Uh, I mean, certainly there's some quantization of the, of the frequencies uh, for sure. Uh, this particular one, and this, this was not from the competition, I just tried to find a decent picture of a spectrogram. But they're looking at, you, you can see some you know, activity here, these, these bars that go across indicate something interesting happened at that frequency and persisted for a while. It's that sort of information that you want to pull out of these uh, spec spectral are, are the bands uh, distinct and are they, uh, say, Common across different subjects. Broadly speaking, yes. Um, we have probably all heard of alpha waves. You know, when you're relaxed, you're, uh, when you're alpha waves. Those are EEG terms, um, and they refer to a particular frequency band. It's pretty pretty broad band in that case. Um, but and I think it's about like six standard ones that people look at. We'll see. We'll see a little bit more about that in a second. But yeah. And, oh, th now we're seeing it now. Wow. Uh, well, obviously, you're not meant to read this, but it's just kind of cool. Wikipedia, if you go there and look at EEG spectral bands, it, it tells you, you know, here's the band, delta, theta, alpha, et cetera, et cetera. Where is it located? Um, you know, adult slow wave sleep in, in normal subjects and so on, where these things happen. If you're pathological, you know, what, what can it indicate? Um, so that's, that's cool. So... These particular bands, though, they're, they're standardized. People have worked with this data for a long time. So uh, the frequency, for example, for alpha waves is between 8 and 15 hertz. Uh, so if you're going to use these frequency bands in your feature selection, which probably you are, uh, it would make sense to use the existing ones that are known to have physiological significance. Okay, spatial information. I think we talked about this completely now. Uh, Okay, other random information specific to this competition. And I promise you, we're going to talk about what the competitors actually did at some point. Uh, it's very important, you can't use data from the future. So you're given this, the entire time series, from the you know, beginning time zero right up to four minutes. Um, but what you're trying to do 
is create a, a system where you can interpret now what the person is intending to do, you, all, you don't have future information at that point, right? You can only use past information to do that prediction. So, okay, duh. Uh, however, it turns out to be pretty tricky to not accidentally use data from the future. And there are so many scripts that were published that it's like, oh, I got this thing, it's great on the leaderboard, and they like, no, you use future information because of this subtle effect. For example, suppose you want to subtract off the mean of the uh, signal that you got in a particular channel. Standard thing to do, you just want to normalize a little bit. You may think the mean's not actually significant and it's just kind of messing up your statistics, so you just want to subtract off the mean. You can't. That's global information that requires you to know the entire uh, values of, across the entire time duration, including the future. So, uh, and I'll come back to that particular example because I don't know how one of the competitors got away with subtracting the mean, actually. Uh, <laughs> You could subtract the mean at each instant. You could, well, you could, you could have a you could subtract the past mean from the current one. Yeah. But it's it's kind of a mess. I mean, this stuff is you know there's significance in the deviations away from the mean. So your your running mean is going to be kind of all over the place. You're going to introduce all this waviness. Yeah. It's not completely obvious what you want to do. What you really want to do is subtract the mean off from the whole thing. Yeah. Now, what you what you are allowed to do, interestingly enough, is um, you can take, oh, this is probably what he did. You can take the mean from one series and subtract it off from another series. I think that's allowed. So you can, you can use future data from one series to adjust your, the one you're looking at right now. I shouldn't be allowed either. Uh, you, uh, you don't think I should be allowed either? Well, you don't have that information. No, I know. In it's, situ. yeah. There was just a ton of back and forth on the forums about what you can do across series and within series and across <laughs> subjects. <laughs> So, but that was allowed, I agree. Uh, that's one of many things that make this not ready for prime time clinically. Yes, is that a question? No? Oh, you're just oh, uh, twitching. I was just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just thinking about how you're gonna make money off this. <laughs> yeah. uh, the data set is public, actually. Uh, the authors wrote a paper on how they gathered this data. Uh, interestingly enough, series nine labels are public. That was one of the sets that's used for tests where you have to predict the labels. So hey, just go look them up. So that sounds like uh, that's a big gimme. However, it um, doesn't help that much because it's only used for the public leaderboard. Um, and Series 10 was reserved for the private leaderboard. So it, when they score you at the end of the competition, they use this held back data that there's no way you would know what the labels are for that. And that's, that's how they determine how accurate you are. But still, if you really wanted to cheat, uh, you know, you're limited to a certain number of submissions today, uh, every day. And when you submit, you get your rating on the public leaderboard. If you wanted to cheat, you could just go get these labels for Series 9 and just like overfit like crazy to that data. But training to those, if you train a model to those labels, that would be illegal, right? Uh, that would be illegal to train the models to those yeah, labels. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's kind of like the competition hopes are kind of like, look, we're hoping people are in this to try to advance the state of knowledge, and we can't like plug every loophole, and you know, that's just the way it is. Um, another thing that happens a lot in Kaggle competitions, if you're new to this, um, partway through to discover an error in the data set, and just like, reset, here's the new data, sorry everybody. And what <laughs> um, It meant they had to retrain all their models that they developed. They didn't have to throw out all their models, but all the results they had and what they thought they were learning was trying to be wrong. I forget how far into the competition this, this happened. It's another reason to, uh, if you want to get into these competitions, don't jump in on the first day if you're new to this stuff. <laughs> Just let things settle out for a week or two. <laughs> uh, we talked about this a little bit, but they expect you to model per subject. Uh, no one expects at this point the state of the art is going to be able to take a model that works well for one person and then just use that same model on a different person and have it get good results. It's, so even in clinical practice, you would you'd have to you know uh, train the model for the specific person, and then whatever uh, device you give them would be very specific to them. And as we talked about, the six events guaranteed to occur in the same order every time. All right. So some people actually entered this competition. <laughs> Let's talk about them. Uh, the number one winner was the cat and dog. 
a team consisting of two people, Alexandre Berchon and Raphael Sacon, I probably butchered both of their names. Um, they, their private leaderboard score, that's the one that counts, uh, 0.981, really, really good, really good. Uh, who are they? So AB, he's a, an EE specialist, he's a postdoc at Cornell, he got his PhD in this field a few a couple of years before uh, the competition, so he really had a ton of domain knowledge. Uh, RC, uh, he's more on the machine learning side, he's got a master's in that, he's running a data science startup. So they found each other fairly early on in the competition, and obviously those are good complementary skills to have. Uh, I'm going to digress just a little bit, because as, as I was reading through the interview with these guys, uh, they made the statement that there is no doubt that we are indeed decoding brain activity related to hand movement, uh, which is, of course, the point of the competition, uh, but there is reason to doubt whether that's actually happening. You're measuring something, and you're predicting something, and you're getting 0.98. But is it really brain activity related to hand movement, or is it something else? I have to say, there's a lot of these Kegel competitions where the results just seem too good to be true to me. <laughs> this is one of them. Um, what do you think is leakages? Right here. Two things. Visual activity. A light goes on, and your brain lights up when that happens. All sorts of things. So that's going to get picked up by the EEG. In fact, these this team, as we'll see in a minute, explicitly used a, a visual evoked potential as one of their features. Like, what? Whereas one of the other teams explicitly dropped a couple of channels because it was too polluted by visual artifacts uh, in the brain. Okay, so there's visual activity going on. This thing we talked about before, the EMG sensors uh, measuring the muscle action, could be inf interference from those sensors. Uh, so I'm just a teeny, teeny bit skeptical. But uh, the person who said this was uh, Alex, and he knows like way more about this than I do. So you know. All right, here's um, an overview of the the pipeline of their processing, and I'm I'm going to talk about each of these in a uh, little bit of detail. Um, I'm here for time, pretty bad. Eh? Wow. <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to scoot through some of the stuff, or we'll, we'll never finish. So, um, okay, so over here, they start with the, the raw data, and they do some pre-processing. This is mm, semi, no, I was going to say standard, it's not. The first one is, is pretty standard. So they do a, a filter bank, a series of, I say a series of low-pass filters. I would have done a series of band-pass filters myself, but uh, does it make sense? It was just low-pass? Not to me. Didn't think about that before. Anyway, they, they you know, figure out the frequency content, uh, but they just look at certain frequency ranges. Uh, so those are features, and of course you can change the uh, the boundaries on which you know feature feature range you're looking at to get a whole bunch of different features. Uh, neural oscillation, I'll come back to that. Event related potential. So they those are the, uh, the raw data generates these low level features. They put it in these level one models. Um, logistic regression, LDA, it's fairly simple linear uh, type things to generate. Simple uh, outputs, more features basically. They're generating now meta features out of that, feed into more sophisticated models, current neural networks, CNNs, etc., XG boost. And then finally, so at this point they've got a whole whack of models, I think about 34, 35, and they, they do some sort of weighted mean on those, and that gives their prediction. Okay, pretty, in some ways it's kind of standard, uh, certainly in the sense of making many, many models and then ensemble and the results at the end. All right, the pre-processing, uh, there were kind of three things that went on. The filter bank we talked about, they had some variations on that. The thing they called neural oscillation, I think it's what is uh, called common spatial pattern in the literature. I'm not sure why they didn't ever use that term. Um, this is, it's really, it's actually really cool. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about it, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of cool. Uh, but it has to do with um, you calculate covariance matrices and uh, of the the data, and uh, it's it's a dimensionality reduction technique effectively, and that's that's something to do with that. Uh, anyway, then there's the. Just want to add something. So yes. Uh, with multiple channels in EEG, a lot of the events are correlated. Yeah. And that's probably what this also captures. Um, yeah. Because in a, I've worked on an EEG competition before, and you can't get away without, yeah, you know, catching some sort of correlation patterns between the right. 
channels in uh, order to extract meaningful features. Yeah, but uh, the CSP actually um, is a very specific type of decorrelation. I, I wouldn't even, they don't call it decorrelation, but it, it's, that's one of the reasons they do it. I mean, it's, it's more like a PCA sort of thing in a way. Um, but uh, others did talk about, uh, you know, whitening the signal, which is a decorrelation technique. And actually that kind of wrecked things. They, they said it didn't work very well for them. So. But it's true. Uh, these sensors are, you know, they're not that far away from each other. They're not very precise spatially. So there's going to be a lot of correlation, you would, you would think. Uh, okay, and the uh, event-related potential, which is this averaging thing. Here's, here's the better picture I was trying to show where um, you average a lot of events. This is sort of the, the signature of a particular type of event, and I'm pretty sure this is laid out to somehow reflect the, the sensors uh, where they might be. I was thinking, oh, look at those big spikes. That's, uh, that's amazing. That's, they really, uh, no, no, no. The spikes are the reference times that they knew <laughs> so that they lined them up. So what you have to look at is forget the spikes, but look at the little wiggles and you know ask yourself, could you, if you saw those wiggles, would you be able to uh, identify the feature working backwards from that? So anyway, that's the uh, the sort of pre-processing that they were doing. The level one models were subject specific and for the most part event specific as well. Um, so they're creating a whole bunch of different models, and the goal is to create meta features. Uh, Again, sort of a standard way they did this, but it's good to, to know about if you haven't encountered this before. So the training data, they have training data for series one to eight. So what they did was they just picked one to six and then they used seven to eight as a validation set. And they did this because they wanted to uh, create a whole bunch of different models and there's gonna be different parameters and hyperparameters and things that uh, will lead to a better or worse model. They'll use this validation set to pick out the best model. Once they had the set of models they actually wanted to use, they went back and retrained those models on the entire data set, training set, and then used those to, to predict uh, on the unknowns. Uh, and those are the type models they use. I mean, there's, there's a recurrent neural network there, very simple, uh, uh, simple uh, convolutional neural network. It was kind of interesting. They actually gave credit to the number three winner for that, <laughs> that CNN. I, mean, I, I would think anyone who posts, you know, is sort of serious about the competition and, and posts this group kind of wonders if they're just helping out the competition. Well, mm -hmm. they are <laughs> in this case. Uh, the level two models. Um, now they're able to take a little bit more into account this, this temporal structure, uh, the fact that there, there is this order of the six events, um, and event relationships, which uh, I'm not quite sure what that means now that I think about it. Um, but anyway, they take those level one models and they feed it through, again, an RNN, a bunch of CNNs, regular multi-layer perceptron type networks, and XGBoost, and they put it into this fancy-dancy weighted mean, uh, which is basically, we're taking all the outputs of the level two models and ensembling them together. They actually did three types of weighted means. <clears throat> um, arithmetic, geometric, which you've probably encountered before, then they did a power mean, which I don't think they invented, uh, seen that one before too. Uh, and they chose the weights on these to maximize the AUC. Now, one thing that's not completely obvious is that when you're doing uh, these neural networks, uh, you have an objective function and you're using gradient descent to minimize that objective function. That's how you train your weights. Um, the objective function you'd like to use is the AUC because you're trying to win against and that's what you're being scored against. AUC is not a differentiable function. So um, this gets in the way of you using it for, for gradient descent. Uh, there are such things as differentiable approximations to the AUC, but nobody used that. Uh, instead, you you train against you know the cross entropy, a more sort of run of mill thing that is differentiable. Uh, but at some point, you want to, and, and you hope that a model that's good in that way is also going to be good relative to AUC. But at some point, you want to bring the AUC into it, and so they did it this way, and we'll see some of the other competitors did it in, in different ways. Uh, they chose the weight specifically to maximize AUC, and then they did the ensemble after that. All right. Uh, they, these specifically mentioned that the 150 millisecond window was challenging. It's not physically super meaningful. Yes? 
Um, so they use three different levels of model, right? Can yep. they explain why they chose this one as level one, level two, and level three? Like, did they go through the logic behind it, or? Well, it's 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 how would you? I mean, it's kind of a hierarchical approach to the problem. You, you you're starting with extremely low level data. Uh, raw data, extremely low level features like you know one time sample. And the idea is to abstract that to higher and higher level features. It's just kind of a way of organizing that abstraction. Okay. So you start with the raw data and then you go to these features like like uh, filter bank bands and then you go to like a logistic regression. You know, at each stage you're getting more and more general. It, it would be hard to do that all in one go. Uh, and uh, it's just kind of a way of organizing that. What, what kind of meta feature are you talking about? Take, take for example, logistical regression, for example. What's the meta feature from that? It would be a, a probability of a class. So it's just a single, time. Value, single feature? Yeah. Um, yeah. But you've got several different models that you do logarithms, like it's that logic on. And um, so you have like a whole bunch of these. Sorry, you said like do logistic regression for, for everyone. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, you'd run it on all the things that come out of here. Like maybe you've got 20 models coming out of this, or 20 features, uh, or collections of features. Like it could be hundreds of features. I'm not sure how many they had. Yeah, you you train them all on a whole bunch of different variations on logistic regression, and that becomes features. Uh, those predictions then become features that you then train on here. Okay, so then the lower level features will be discarded. Uh, in the, like, yeah, that's right. I mean, by the time you get here, you're not looking at raw data anymore. That's yeah. been abstracted away. By the time you get here, you're not looking at these features anymore. You're just looking at what the previous layer is giving to you. Um, oh. Sorry. Sure, go ahead. Uh, so what if you were to use the low-level features but augment them with the features that come out of the level one? Yes. Uh, some people did go directly, just use the the raw features. So we'll see the other competitors did something more like that. But these guys didn't really. They, you know, uh, Alex knows a whole bunch about EEGs and damn it, these are important things, so we're going to calculate these features and then we're going to learn from that. Maybe didn't he win the competition. Because, What's maybe, that? maybe he just did it because that's the way people had worked with those sorts of signals in the past. Yeah, and he was totally familiar with that and one, sure. I think one thing they mentioned was the level two is where they introduced the global and mm -hmm. level one was the patient specific. Yes. There will be a bunch of stuff like based on where the EEGs were or what a person's brain is like, which will be specific to people. But there will also be a bunch of stuff which you kind of do want to learn overall that will be common between how people do so. Um, and you want to be able to separate these things. Right. right. Like if you try and learn everything globally, there will be based on where the EEG was stuff that will just add noise to you without yeah. any correct guesses. Yeah, that's a good point. You get a really terrible score. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Stupid question. But Good. Like, uh, <laughs> um, when you're in, when you when you're ensembling, is the thing that you backpropagate like the, the prediction for all of the neural networks in the level two, or is it just uh, uh, the prediction for each one? So uh, when you're ensembling here, yeah. Um, so you are getting um, predictions from all of these level two models. Yeah. And you are, for example, taking the average of them. Yeah, what do you back, what do you back properly? Uh, well, that'd be a question about how do they maximize the AUC, I guess, or I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't think they described exactly what they did for that, it's in the code, but I didn't look. So somehow they figured out a way to, to figure out the weights of, the, of these means to, to do that. But yeah, I don't, it, it wouldn't be exactly back propagation because of the non-differential nature of this. It's a very small calculation, so you could probably just forward propagate in a way. Uh, maybe. Just brute force it. Just find keep, the yeah, you just do some gross search. Yeah. yeah. So can you say this is kind of a two layer thing? Layer one is uh, preparing and a level one, level two. And the layer two is this uh, level three thing. And we can see this uh, layer two is kind of a translator. It translates from uh, accuracy into AUC. Can you see that? Uh, and, and uh, I wouldn't say that. I was with you right up until you said that. Um, but it is. Um, yeah, I guess I just think of it as going to sort of higher level features all the time uh, at each at each stage. No, it looks like, uh, 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 let's say, level three is totally independent from level two. I mean, there is no interaction between them. Well, you don't True. you don't go back. That's for sure. Back, yeah. um, 
Right. Everything just just goes forward in, in this model. Yeah. And there, but there is no interaction. It's true. Yeah. I mean, you cannot to. Uh, when we are trying to maximize this AUC, we cannot readjust the, the no. model up there. No, you don't. When you maximize AUC, you're not going back to here right. at all. You're right. just working within what came out of this blue arrow right. here. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I better uh, push on here. Uh, that was challenging. I don't know much care to be taken to avoid using future data. The other problem with future data is you're doing all this Fourier transform stuff, and uh, oh. you're, you're doing low-pass filters. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Some of those ways actually use data that's ahead of where you are right now. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful about that. Lots of people got tripped up on that stuff. Surprises. Uh, a lot of predictive power in very low frequency content, which you don't normally get uh, from uh, EEGs. Hmm. To me, that would suggest maybe we're not training on EEG data, but something else. Uh, that wasn't their conclusion. Good. What is low, very low frequency? Yeah, I wish, you know, EEG data is pretty low frequency, actually. I mean, look at those alpha waves and stuff, they're way down there. So I didn't, they didn't elaborate, and I don't know what they mean. Uh, good, really good performance when they ran their covariance models in this frequency range, which was surprising because it's too high to contain anything to do with EEGs. So, okay, so what are you training on exactly? E EMG, maybe? I don't know. Uh, and there was a kind of a technical point about regularizing HD boost. So all this makes me just a little bit surprised. Uh, nevertheless, good pipeline, good good way to lay things out. They obviously got great results and uh, more power to them. Well, if you read the comment, there was a guy who said that he was another EEG researcher and there absolutely was significant information in that frequency band. Okay. Oh, okay. That's interesting. So, so apparently uh, Alex doesn't know everything about EEGs. So, EMG apparently ranges from about 1 hertz to 400 hertz. So oh, that would be there. That would be there. Okay, you see, they should have had me as a consultant. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about competitor number three and then come back to competitor number two. And there's less to say about competitors three and two, so this won't take quite as long. Uh, but I know you're all having fun anyway. Um, so, this is 0.97996. You remember the, the number one team got 0 0.90 something. Um, when I first saw these Kaggle competitions and how close these numbers were, I thought, wow, that's like crazy random stuff. But man, to move from here up like in the third decimal place, up something can be really hard sometimes. So it's significant to some extent anyway. So four people on this team, they kind of coalesced partway through the competition of at least the first two. I know, I, I'm not sure about the other two, but they, they published scripts and everyone was kind of excited about what they were doing, and uh, anyway, they found each other. So uh, H, uh, he's a lapsed physicist, now hey. he's a double E, and uh, he's got a PhD in that. He designs electronic test equipment in his day job. Uh, Elena is actually a working physicist in gravitational waves, um, so technically probably actually well suited to this kind of problem. And then a couple of students who actually work on assistive uh, technologies, although neither of them knew any about EEGs at all. So the team has kind of got a good technical base, but no domain knowledge. Uh, the primary approach that they took it was uh, basically use convolutional neural networks with just filter bank pre-processing. Uh, that almost sums up the whole thing. It's almost all you have to say, uh, but we'll say a little bit more. Uh, the final model was an ensemble of 34 of these networks. We spent little time on feature engineering. So this warms my heart. <laughs> who know me know we that I think... Feature engineering is like, it's so last six months, and now it's all about just let the networks figure it out for you. Um, Jesus. Yeah, so they trained a whole whack of networks that look sort of like this. Uh, these are the guys that said they dropped the first two channels because too much ocular interference, the eyes. Uh, they treated uh, this uh, EEG data as if it was a one pixel high image and really, really wide, and which has uh, 32 channels, like 32 colors. Normally we have RGB and images, they have 32 different things. So then all those techniques that people use for image processing kind of apply. Uh, so in some ways, this is like a semi-standard uh, convolution neural network, except that um, these four differences, and it's worth touching on. So I'm kind of assuming people know something about CNNs, so if you don't, just go to sleep for a minute. 
they do not already sleep. Uh, so the first layer, they take the 32 channels, and but they only output six channels, um, and that's to do some noise reduction and take advantage of the correlations that are probably there to reduce noise. The second layer, they actually use a stride 16, so the, um, the filter kernel that they're using is 16 wide, and they move it across by 16 every time. That's, that's a little unusual. They do that specifically to learn subsampling. Uh, these uh, one series is like 120,000 samples. It is way more than you just want to deal with. So if they got to subsample it somehow, they just let the network learn how to subsample. Uh, at stride eight, uh, or there's a, a stride eight, which is down here, they um, did a max pool, but they also split off some points and just had them bypass the max pooling. So exactly how that works out dimension-wise is that I guess it, it does, but. That was interesting, um, and they said they did that, I don't know, I think it was a random, desperate Hail Mary pass to try to get things to work a little better. They didn't give a very convincing explanation as to why that was necessary, but you don't see that sort of thing very often. Uh, anyway, so they this was just an example of one network that they did. They made a whole bunch of them, and um, again, did a sort of a cross-validation thing to pick up the best ones and use that as their ensemble. The runtime of the final model is about four days. So as you're getting up closer to the competition deadline, you're thinking, ah, I don't have many times to iterate this anymore. Is this to make predictions? No, no, <laughs> this is to train, <laughs> train the model. To train the model. Yeah. <laughs> the make predictions is coming up, though. Um, what do you hey, know what kind of, uh, so many questions at once, sorry. Go ahead. Do you know what kind of hardware they used? Uh, you kind of. Mm, I, if I knew, I would have put it in the slide, but people seem to be using uh, sort of uh, GTX 980 GPUs, a couple of them, maybe. Nothing gigantic. Although, the number one winner, he must have had access to more hardware. He's, he's a university student, I think he was like just hammering on everything they had. Uh, but I think this was just a couple of 980s, so, you know. Reasonably affordable stuff. Of course, it's completely eclipsed by what you know Vince has now. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, when they go from thirty-two to six channels, the order that the channels are in is important. So, did they say anything about that? Ever? Ah, that's an interesting thought. Yeah, because no, nope. okay. didn't say anything about right. that. I guess it just Magic. had to learn what the order was. Or what order was important. Or they randomly picked an order and that was okay. Well, I'm sure they fed it in in the right order, but that doesn't Because, I mean, they probably the network, number right? the channels, if there's like 32 channels, they probably go, uh, you know, like 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, 888, well, you, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess you're predicting at the leading edge of the window. Yeah, so you have to right. make sure that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everyone who published a script, there was like a hundred eyes on it. Oh, you're using the future, you're using the future. I mean, they're really... <laughs> future like, they, police. People, <laughs> yeah, the future <laughs> police were just on it right away. <laughs> and uh, so I think by the end of the competition, people figured out how not to use the future. But... <laughs> Yeah, no, it really cramps your style to not use mm -hmm. the future. I mean, online processing is always a challenge compared to, to batch, which is kind of what the difference is. All right, carrying on. Uh, so there's their, their pipeline. Uh, it, you know, this is a little easier to understand. Delta, theta, et cetera. A filter uh, bank channels. Uh, a little bit of channel selection here, by which they mean dropping the, the two channels they didn't like. Um, validation selection. Uh, which means they do cross validation to help get parameters and stuff. Uh, EP, uh, EPS, oh, band pass filtering. Maybe they did some band pass filtering. Anyway, a whole bunch of stuff, mostly just frequency filtering. Throw it into a whole whack of CNNs. <clears throat> uh, do you have a CNN for frequency band? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Oh, several <laughs> CNNs per frequency band. Yes. All of those CNNs are the same model that we saw in the No, that's an example of one model. They did many, many, many models, picked the ones they liked the best, and ended up, I think, 34 of them. I would probably say the next next thing a little bit here. So the ensemble was just a, a simple a simple weighted average, and where the weights come from, I'm not sure. Uh, they did a whole bunch of things to try to diversify the nets as much as they could, uh, meaning you don't want to just 
end up with the same predictions from all these things. You want them to be different in some way. They have them looking at different aspects of the data. And they did that by varying the frequency ranges that they're looking at and all sorts of tricks. They even varied their validation methods. Drop the first two channels, we talked about that. So it didn't work. They tried to do that uh, the covariance thing. Didn't work for them because of the overlapping events. They wanted to do more channel selection, but they ran out of time. These are the guys that tried to do the decorrelation. They just had, it just messed up the data. Didn't, it did more harm than good. Uh, in the context of training a model for each subject, uh, what's the relationship between that and the 34? Uh, like are these? That's a great question. Uh, pretty sure these guys did per subject. So I guess the 34 split across, or maybe it's 34 per subject. I don't know. I don't know. It's a great question. Don't know. Uh, what were they surprised about? Well, they're surprised that CNNs actually work well for this kind of data. It is a little freaky to just throw a CNN at it and say, figure it out, and it does. Uh, the best single model performance, so Friel is ensembling and stuff, was better than 97% uh, AUC. Ah, that's pretty good. Uh, that's pretty good. But the biggest surprise to them was Team 2. So we haven't <laughs> talked about Team 2 yet. <laughs> team 2. Ming Liang, uh, on the private leaderboard, 0 0.980, da, da, da. PhD student who has invented a variation on the standard convolutional neural network called the recurrent convolutional neural network. We'll see that in just a second. He, he doesn't know anything about EEG data. He doesn't know anything about Kaggle. He just thought this would be a way to get some attention for his little discovery of RCNMs. His best single model is 0.97. Six six one. That yeah. is like amazing the way it's good for a single model. And this is what team three of what just blew them away. Um, so um, I could talk about this for hours and I still wouldn't understand it. But the general idea is uh, your RCNN is it, you stack up a whole bunch of uh, units which are like regular neural network convolutional units, but then you've got this recurrent thing that's, that's going on in them. And um, he, you, you just example, you're like three time steps that you use for the recurrence. Uh, I still haven't completely figured out how this works and whatever, but um, it makes a little bit of sense. He just, do I say what he says about it? No. He uh, makes some comment about how there's you know, justification because in nature there's lots of uh, things that basically amount to intralayer recurrences that happen all the time, but nobody reflects that in there. Modeling, he does, gets great results on, you know, MNIST and all the other uh, standard benchmarks. Uh, and then he did, got a great result uh, here as well. Uh, believe it or not, this was going to be explanatory, but I think I better skip over it. <laughs> uh, so here's a typical network for him. And I don't have a nice picture, but uh, maybe this is more informative anyway. So the first layer is a standard convolutional network. Uh, the 64 here is his batch size, so you can sort of ignore that. Uh, 3584, he just down samples the 120,000 samples to 3584. And um, you know, one is the, the shape of the uh, uh, value of the kernel. These are what they're one by nine uh, filters. Anyway, standard convolutional network uh, does some max pooling. I think this is as much to uh, make the whole processing stream a little more efficient uh, just by reducing the data size in a, some sort of sensible way. Then he puts on one of his recurrent uh, convolutional layers and stacks those up. So in this particular case, he's got four of them. There's max pooling in between. And the final thing is to put on a fully connected layer with six outputs. And those are his uh, six predictions. So he did like a bajillion of these. Um, Pre-processing per channel average remove, that's the thing I was suspicious about. Seems like future data to me, but maybe he did it in one series and applied it in the first series. Um, Downsample, but no filter banks, no processing of any other kind. He just likes some samples. Uh, if you know these various CNN frameworks, Lasagna is the one that works with Seattle, so he used that. He said he made, uh, the ensembling is a really important part of what he was doing, and he made a bunch of mistakes uh, with it, so right up until end of a deadline, like all those things stopped improving. Um, and it wasn't clear whether he fixed it at the last minute or what happened there. Uh, if I was him, I would have fixed it up and at least tried it again afterwards and had bragging rights for, for doing better. But anyway, 
Uh, he had some heart attack moments toward the end of the uh, deadline. Uh, many hours needed to train a model. How long does it take to take? Uh, how many hours does it take to train a model? Many. Was all he said. Um, I've trained one of his models once. Uh, Vince trained it once. Four or five hours, I think it was. The, yeah. yeah. The setup is just incredible. The setup's incredible, and you just run this thing, and it just grinds away. And so, like four to five hours per model, and uh, we'll see in a minute how many models he must have. You count it? Hmm? How many models he tried? Uh, I think it's about thirty-six ish. Well, I think it's on the next slide. Times four times. Oh yeah, but then there's all the models you didn't use, right? Because he did this thing where he tested a whole bunch of models, just picked the best ones. So like at four hours per. This is why I think he had access to a little more hardware than you and I have. <laughs> and uh, but it takes about an hour to generate test data. So that's back to Quentin's observation before or question. Um, you know, if you want to use this in clinical practice, you're going to have to make your predictions super fast, uh, like. You can probably tolerate a delay of, I don't know, half a second or something, but uh, now, an hour sounds like you're very far from that. Keep in mind, this is uh, uh, thousands of uh, experiments that, are, that you're um, generating test predictions for, so you've got to factor it by. It's four minutes, right, I think? That was how long the uh, one, like, session was? One, one series is four minutes long, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's the kind of ratio, yeah. Well, now, I'm not even sure that's the right right ratio to look at, uh, but you'd have to, yeah. It, it'd be interesting to know. There was no constraint on anybody in the competitors to be uh, to have a high performance in their in their thing. That would be maybe for a future competition. Um, this sounds crazy far away from where you want it to be. I'm not sure it's that crazy when you factor it down to a single prediction at the but I haven't done that calculation. But that would be, they should have asked them that. If I was the interviewer, I would have asked that question because it seems pretty interesting. Okay. Qualitatively, what, what did he do? So he wanted six models, uh, one for each event type, not six models, six sets of models, one for each event type. That's right, he ended up with uh, 36 total, uh, with six per each of the six uh, event types. Uh, so he, Created a whole bunch of candidate models. He fiddled with uh, oh man, ten different hyperparameters, varied the architecture, and did this uh, four-way cross-validation uh, technique to pick up the best ones. Same as what the uh, uh, team one did. Uh, cross entropy loss. Uh, the models are just ensemble via averaging. No, uh, no funny business there. But he did do something to get the AUC into it explicitly which is he used what he called greedy forward selection. I think that's his own term. So how do you create one of these sets? You start with an empty set, and then you generate a bunch of models, and you add them to the set one at a time, and you calculate the AUC that you get against your validation, and the one that's the best, you keep that. And then um, the next step, you, you add in a second thing. You keep doing that, and the way you ensemble within the set is just a straight averaging of what you did it or in. So, um, yeah, makes, makes sense if you've got the horsepower to do it. Uh, many, many models. All right, so the epic ending of all this, that's, that's it for the three different teams and what they did. But everyone was so surprised by the result that this guy had with his RCNN that they wanted to do more. So here's a quote, you know, we've now formed a team of five people, four of whom are from teams that finished for second and third in this competition, to continue working on this, with the target of publishing at least a, a conference paper. So I this is not that many months ago, well, yeah, it's getting about nine months ago, so I don't know what's happened with this, I haven't followed up on it, maybe, maybe they've done something. But I thought that was cool, you'd think the Kaggle guys and the host of the competition would be ecstatic about this, it's perfect, like out of the individual competitors they got some interesting new techniques and results, <clears throat> and then they're going to, like now they're going to ensemble the people and uh, do even better, and who knows what they're going to come up with, so, so very cool. <laughs> and uh, usually you talk like this as kids, don't try this at home. Said, I'm going to tell you, you know what, you could try this at home. <laughs> along the way, I encountered these things. These are like, uh, here's a five channel uh, EEG. It's a mobile EEG, in fact. Uh, it's like 300 bucks, 800 bucks. You can get 14 channels. Uh, I bet this is just a royal pain to actually set up. It probably takes like an hour to get it working right now. There are various sort of EEG like devices out there for, for consumers, which are not actually terrible, um, apparently. <laughs> So, Do you have to shave your head? 
No, they you don't. But sometimes you have to. I actually watched a video on how they did it, and it was a woman with you know reasonably long hair. Uh, so they put gel on. Of course, you know that gets all messed up and everything. But then in a couple of places, they have this thing that can tell right away if there's if they're not getting a good signal. So they go back to that particular one and they kind of they kind of mush it around. They kind of you do all this and yeah. But here's a problem. No, I, I'm sure if somebody walks in with a shaved head, they're like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Do you see any good applications using this thing? Of these things? Yeah. No, I didn't go that far. I, I only got as far as their website and, I, and their marketing materials make it sound fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, a, there's another one called from a company called Muse, M-U-Z-E, that has, it's basically, not you're not getting raw EEG data out of that one, this one you are. Um, but they do something, and it becomes this sort of biofeedback thing you do to improve your meditation. Uh, and it gets great reviews on Amazon. Um, that's all I can tell you. People, you know, they, they come up with this use case for it, and it seems to actually work for that specific thing. So, some lady made a, a lie detector out of it. <laughs> Lie detector or love detector? <laughs> love detector. Maybe love detector. Love detector would be a great thing to have. Uh, exactly how you get the person of interest to put it on. I don't know. Uh, you hook it up with a VR thing. You say, yeah, it's just a VR helmet. Just like. It's <laughs> like a dating app. You submit your. EVs yeah. And you that's right. Yeah. You shake it left or right. And you're like, oh, you're sure. All right, folks, that's. That's it, that's the EEG competition.